So good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you. Welcome to the Ford Foundation. I'm Darren Walker, and I have the great privilege of serving as president of the Ford Foundation and welcoming you today. It's so amazing to look across this room and see so many people I have known for far too many years to count <laughs> who I've learned from and who have been walking with me on this journey, this mad, crazy journey that I've had as I arrived in New York City um, in 1985 and uh, my life was transformed in so many ways. I want to thank my uh, friend, the incomparable Tom Finkelpearl. <laughs> Tom, for your incredible leadership. I want to thank my colleagues at Ford, Roberta Uno, Roberta, the remarkable Roberta, who you may have heard today <laughs> share the news that she is going to be leaving us to, I know, Roberta, that was an audible gasp. <laughs> Roberta, no, you weren't going to sneak out of here, Roberta. Roberta is going to be a, come a chair at this amazing arts school that some of you may have heard of, Cal Arts. And uh, um, and um, so she sprung this news on me recently. And um, I also want to thank Jonathan Barzillet, who is the director of the Freedom of Expression program, which includes our work in the arts, and Jonathan is here, and Jonathan, too, has sprung some news on me. <laughs> Jonathan is going to become Chief Operating Officer of PBS, so he will be going to PBS in March. And I hope you all won't interpret this. <laughs> I certainly don't interpret it. Um, to mean that I'm just a terrible, horrible, awful boss, but hopefully that um, that they have opportunities that they've waited um, a career for, and in each case, um, Jonathan and Roberta, um, you have served with such remarkable distinction, this institution, so um, thanks to you both. <laughs> so, so I want to just say a few things about um, the arts. I think we are all here because we're passionate about the arts. For me, today's meeting, this conversation is very personal because I was a little kid in a small town, Ames, Texas, population 1,400. And my grandmother used to bring home these bags, these little brown paper piggly wiggly bags and they'd be filled with art books and shelter magazines because she worked for these wealthy white families in Houston. And she'd bring home what they discarded. So I was the recipient of all sorts of goodies. But what I loved most were these books, these art books, these books that transported me away from that little shotgun house in a small town in East Texas. And then I went to University of Texas. I went to Austin, where I saw for the first time the Dance Theater of Harlem. I remember seeing for Colored Girls in 1981, the little theater there in Austin, Texas, doing that production. And my life was really transformed. So for me, this conversation today is not an abstraction. This is something that is very personal because in so many ways, my life has been transformed. And I've been able to think about the possibilities of a poor black kid from a small town in Texas actually having a life far beyond in a way in which I could never have dreamed. And so the arts is fundamental. The arts, it's essential. Less diversity in our arts community leads to less diversity in the arts. And less diversity in the arts leads to less equality in our society. And we know that less equality equals less justice. A society in which poor kids like me, boys and girls in small towns and in housing projects and in all sorts of places don't have the opportunity to have dreams. So the arts are about making dreams possible. And diversity, I want to just be frank, so much of this 
conversation about diversity is connected to an insidious misperception of why diversity matters in the first place. For so many institutions, diversity is often and incorrectly viewed in terms of sacrifice. On many boards, particularly institutions where fundraising responsibilities loom large, the idea of diversity means that you're going to give up the opportunity to raise more money. In so many cases, when we talk about and hear about diversity, it's through the lens of deficit. It's as a cost, as what we're having to trade off. Something lost, not something gained. This is an idea that we here at the Ford Foundation profoundly disagree with. We see diversity not as a sacrifice, but as a strength. It's not about the absence of something. It's about the presence of something. It's about effectiveness. It's about excellence, organizationally and operationally. In fact, organizational diversity and operational excellence are inextricably linked in my mind. And this is precisely because diversity contributes three of the key ingredients I believe are essential for a successful nonprofit organization. First, diversity brings perspective to our institution. Diversity brings wider networks of advocates and audiences, new links to new webs, and increasingly in our very heterogeneous city and nation, diversity adds legitimacy in a broad-based way in a democracy that is changing before our very eyes. And so as a nation founded on pluralism, we have to protect and promote our conviction that everyone has a unique perspective to share. And for this reason, it's not enough to have so many of our boards comprised of nearly, almost entirely, of older, wealthier, primarily white New Yorkers. By limiting its demographics, we limit our board's relationship to the wider democracy of which we are a part. We make ourselves susceptible to groupthink, and this cuts both ways. And I've been on both sides. As my dear Kathy Brown at New York City Ballet knows, I'm vice chairman of that board, and we were challenged as a board. It wasn't particularly satisfying to walk into a board room where there were well over 40 board members and two African Americans. But what New York City Ballet did was to recognize and name and own the problem. And through a concerted effort, we have built a board that now has six African Americans, more Latinos, Asians than we've ever had in the history of the company. We've got work to do, but the key is that the institution has named the problem and owns and is committed to the solution. And this cuts both ways, as I say, because in the 90s, I was in Harlem at the Abyssinian Development Corporation. And I remember we were staff, all black, board, all black. And there was a moment in which the issue was raised. Well, why not get a white person for our board? <laughs> why not hire some white people on this staff? It was a tough conversation. It wasn't an easy conversation. And some of the same things I heard about, well, who do you know? I mean, <laughs> who's the network we're going to find? I mean, these are things, this isn't just unique to white organizations. This is a universal challenge that we all have. And I am certainly not here today to, to point out that this is only a one-sided problem. It is a challenge that we all have, and solving it will require a collective commitment. So what I would say is we need to embrace diversity because to model it and to demonstrate it 
means we will succeed. Diversity brings a network of ambassadors, networks of creative visionaries and cultural innovators, networks of leaders and managers, political connections, and networks of donors too. And as I say, in a city that is really at this point majority minority, diversity does serve to help ensure legitimacy. Because in a city like New York, when a majority of the citizens look at the leading institutions and don't see a board that looks like them, don't see staff who look like them, and quite often don't hear or see programming that resonates to them, it's easy to understand while, why they might be disaffected or disenchanted or at the very least disconnected. So in many ways, this is a question of values, of what we value as a city. It's a question of governance, not a question of management. And this is often confused because we put the burden of this and it's the burden is how it is felt on the executive directors. This is a governance issue. And in order to increase diversity in arts organizations, those in power, the board of trustees must value diversity. And they must believe that without diversity, there is no excellence. So what we need to do is to find ways to get boards to buy in, to move beyond tokenism and to fundamentally change their cultures. And it's hard to do because more and more pressure is put on boards to raise money. And we've all been in that situation at board meetings when it's time to talk about finding a minority. How many times have I had someone turn to me and say, do you know Oprah? And <laughs> those moments where you think, my goodness, this is not just about money because we need to reimagine the roles of our boards to think beyond capital campaigns to consciousness campaigns. We need to systematize this work and help connect boards in need of diversity to promising candidates. And we need to talk openly about why diversity matters in the arts and beyond. This is not an easy conversation because it requires a change in behaviors, in patterns that perpetuate the same problem year after year. And yet, if our institutions, our cultural institutions aspire to continued relevance, continued excellence, if the arts are to continue moving, inspiring, challenging, provoking, then we all have to change. And that also includes those of us here at the Ford Foundation who have to look at our behavior and what we as a philanthropy do to contribute to solving this problem. And speaking of problem solvers, it's my great honor to introduce my friend, don't stand up yet, Tom, my friend, <laughs> Tom Finkelpearl, who I first met, oh, Tom, it was so long ago. Um, I have known Tom at, um, and his wife, who is a brilliant curator, for many years. But I remember when I first came across Tom through my partner, um, it was because, as my partner said, Tom was doing some of the most interesting, innovative work of any museum in the city. And in so many ways, he was under-recognized because of all of the work going on in Queens that so many of us smug Manhattanites don't fully get. But when I was at Rockefeller, I made my first visit to the Queens Museum, and it was so transformative. And what was clear to me was that Tom had a vision and he, he walked the talk. He so um, manifest all of the ideals that we're talking about today. And when I heard that the mayor might possibly be interested in convincing Tom to take this job, um, you know, 
the phone lines were burning up to City Hall because um, there is no one who could serve New York City and serve all of us who love the arts more and better than the incomparable, the inimitable Thomas Finkel Pearl. Wow. So that's kind of hard to live up to, but thank you very much. Um, so I just actually wanted to do a shout out first that, that in city government, we're working in partnership with, with the elected officials. And there's an excellent elected official uh, who also knows Queens like the back of his hand, the Queens guy and the chairman of the Cultural Affairs Committee, Jimmy Van Bramer, is here. So we get a chance for Jimmy. Uh, I'm only at three events with Jimmy per week, so it's great to see you here. Um, I just wanted to say that when we talk about diversity, we're kind of using race as a starting point. There's a lot of good statistics about race. A lot of what we're going to be talking about today are statistics and, you know, uh, strategies that relate to race. But I do think it's important to mention also, so gender, sexual orientation, disability, these are all different kinds of diversity issues. And in the initiative that we're talking about launching, all of those are important. But I, I just, the um, statistics that I'm going to show are going to center mostly around race. Um, so we want to think about how to diversify cultural institutions, boards, staffs, audiences. But we can't understand what the problem is without data. We actually, in government, you sort of have to have data. You have to be able to say, this is the situation in New York City. There isn't good uh, data in New York City, so we're going to collect data, and we're not going to do anything or take any action until we understand what the data tells us. So it quite is quite possible that you know zoos or gardens have different kinds of diversity issues than dance and theater, and dance and theater might have different diversity issues uh, than visual arts. So it's also extremely important that, that we really look, want to look at see what works. We're not as interested in what doesn't work. Like, what works? What are the strategies that people are using that are successful? But let me just start with some statistics. Okay, the United States population up until 1970 was 10% uh, minority. That's where the word minority came from. It's an old word. We're going to get to the end of this show, this very brief slideshow, and we'll realize the word minority is obsolete. 25 years ago, maybe two out of 10 people in America. Today, maybe 34% of the United States is people of color. 25 years from now, maybe 46%. New York City, I'll get to that in a minute, is a whole different story. Core museum visitors in America right now, 9% are people of color, and the workforce looks the same. Maybe that's not a coincidence. That's not a trajectory that has a future that's viable, that is exhibiting the greatest talents of America. It's also un important to understand, again, that things look different in different fields. We have this uh, from uh, Dance NYC, that maybe 24% of people of color are in the NYC dance workforce. But what is the workforce in dance? That includes, in this survey, I believe, dancers. In museums, maybe it, it wouldn't include artists. So we have to figure out how to, and this is something we need you guys in the audience who are coming from a lot of different fields to help educate us. When we circulate a survey later this year, which you're all going to participate in, uh, we need to know how to co uh, connect, you know, uh, or compare apples to oranges. Like uh, security and maintenance might be the same between dance and theater uh, and visual arts, but maybe not, you know, what the workforce looks like. In any case, the U.S. population today is about 34% minority. Depending on how you define Latino, 65% of New York City today is people of color. If you look back at that slide, we don't know what the workforce looks in New York City, but I wouldn't be surprised if the workforce in New York City looks like that, one out of 10 people of color. So that's the question that we're setting out to, to answer. With your help, we're going to do a series of surveys. I think it's important to note that the surveys are going to be privately funded and that the information collected in the surveys will go to an outside organization. We, if we get information into our inbox at the Cultural Affairs Department, it's foilable, 
And somebody could then just do a FOIL request and get everybody's exact information and they could know exactly how many people of color work at your organization. What we want to do in order not to be sort of pointing fingers and say, you know, have a, a you know, a merit list versus a dismerit list or whatever, uh, what is the difference between dance and theater, between museum curators and museum education departments, between big and small institutions, institutions in the borough, et cetera? That's the information that we're going to ask from the outside consultant so we understand what the problem is and how we're going to address the problem. So, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the things we did at Queens Museum, some of the things that we think work, some of the strategies for uh, recruiting. But first, let me say that there, and Darren mentioned some of the benefits of diversity, and there's a lot of research about this. Um, if you look at these articles, we're going to tweet these articles out, they're going to be on our Facebook page, et cetera. If you think about what diversity brings to an organization, first of all, I have to say at the Queens Museum, it became a better place to work. It was more fun to go to work. More different restaurants in Queens are on my list, you know. <laughs> but also, diversity breeds innovation. Diversity in staffing produces organizational strength. This is not me saying this. This is folks at Forbes, folks at, uh, uh, you know, uh, major research institutions have come up with this. The other thing that I think is quite important to understand in terms of sort of this idea of what works and what doesn't work, and this is the subject of the third, um, that Harvard Business Review article, is that, you know, there are all kinds of initiatives that have to do with, let's say, diversity internships or diversity, you know, exposure in high school to diverse audiences. We need to actually understand what works. Not is it a good thing and we're getting some high school kids in. What actually gets people to become lifelong audience members, to consider uh, a career opportunity in a foundation like uh, Darren, in an in arts museum, or you know, an arts uh, agency. What gets people into jobs is what we're interested in. And I think that there's a lot of uh, research on that. And one of the things that's, uh, that that Harvard uh, Business Review article said is that minority employees uh, who advance furthest have strong social networks. It's those networks. It's not just exposure, it's exposure with a network. Thank you. So I am Tracy Knuckles. I'm Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel at the Department of Cultural Affairs. I think I've had the pleasure of meeting or working with many of you, and I hope to continue to have that opportunity. But I want to say, you've already heard from one great lawyer, not that I'm another great lawyer, but, but <laughs> I just want to give you very, uh, three short practical things to give you some context um, on how cultural affairs is approaching this diversity project. First, we are looking at forward-facing efforts. This means we don't want you to go back to your institutions and start firing people in the name of diversity, okay? <laughs> we want you to consider future opportunities to fill current vacancies and uh, future positions at your institutions in light of diversity. We want to collect data. From that data, help you develop goals and then carry out strategies to fill those, those positions and vacancies with diverse candidates <coughs> when they are in fact qualified for the job. Second, we recognize at Cultural Affairs that one size does not fit all. This is an audience full of diverse organizations, varying in size and budget and discipline and focus. So in the ways that you vary as institutions, so might your diversity efforts and even your definition of, ver of diversity. For some of you, um, focusing on language access is going to be a means to diversify your organization. Some of you will have to deepen recruitment efforts if the survey shows that you have that need. Maybe you need to build a pipeline, or maybe you need to institute your own version of the Rooney Rule. Um, there are lots of avenues forward, and we think that informed by data, we can be a partner. Third, we are taking a long view of diversity, and we expect you to have that same view. Change doesn't happen overnight. Tom will uh, expound on his uh, experience at the Queens Museum, but during his 12-year tenure, he spent his first six years considering the diversity of his staff. And at year six, it became a lot easier to look around and see that that staff actually reflected the community and the city that it served. 
And after year six, it became easier to keep Queen's Museum a more diverse institution. So uh, we want to be a partner. We're already a partner as a funder, but we want to help. So with that, we'll turn to our panels. The first is going to be led by Commissioner Finkel Pearl, and we'll have Arnold Lehman, the chair of the CIG, as well as the Shelby White and Leon Levy director of the Brooklyn Museum, and Teresa Eyring, executive director of Theater Communications Group. So we're actually almost exactly on schedule, if you guys want to sit down. I just want to say one thing that, uh, uh, to follow up on what Maya said, uh, when she was talking about that group of three people that came forward, or, or originally there was one candidate. So uh, there was this, do you guys know what the Rooney Rule is? Any football fans here? No. No, football fans. <laughs> Thelma knows, are you a football fan? Um, any case, so Rooney uh, was the owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers. There was a, a situation in the National Football League, which was sort of like what we're talking about right now. Is actually, I think, 70 to 75 percent of the players in the National Football League are African American. There was a point at which there were almost no coaches or general managers uh, who are African American in the league. What Rooney did was, and this is an old, you know, Irish guy from Pittsburgh. He said, from now on, at the Pittsburgh Steelers. Every time there's an opening, we will interview a person of color for that opening. I'm talking about general manager or coach. There was no requirement. It's not a requirement. We hire somebody of that. They hired a you know, very successful coach. He won the Super Bowl. It's all a good story. That rule was adopted by the National Football League. And in fact, if you are a National Football League team and you don't uh, interview a diverse candidate pool, you get fined. This is the National Football League. That is a rule that has tripled, first doubled, and then tripled the number of African-American head coaches and general managers in the National Football League. <laughs> Teresa Eyring, Executive Director of TCG, which is Theater Communications Group. We are a national organization for theater based here in New York City. Uh, we have about 500 members all across the US. Uh, we're also a grant maker, a publisher, um, an advocate for the arts in Washington, um, a global organization. Uh, so we have uh, many aspects to our programming, but I wanna talk today about our diversity and inclusion and equity work. Um, a bit about how it came about and then really just dive into a few of the action-oriented uh, programming that we've embarked upon. Um, I'm hoping that maybe if I talk briefly about a few of these things and we can get into it later, um, and if you have questions about what we're doing, maybe we can compare notes, collaborate, um, any of those would be great. But TCG um, itself has had diversity as a core value for many, many, many years, um, and we believe that we are very diverse in terms of our staff, our board, our programming, the kinds of grants we give, our publishing, um, but in a strategic planning effort that we undertook at the board level um, starting in 2011 and concluding in 2012, we realized that if we looked out into the theater field, um, our field was not, uh, was not as diverse as we believed our field should be given, given, given our country, given the role of theater in society. Um, and in fact, we were concerned that uh, theater might be replicating the structural weaknesses that exist in the larger society um, and with respect to equity and diversity and inclusion. And we thought we were a little bit, um, we were concerned about that, even a little bit horrified. Theater um, and theater makers are about modeling a new way forward, about helping people imagine new worlds. Um, so how can we very proactively support the theater field in, in embracing inclusion and becoming more diverse. Um, so cutting to the chase, we developed what is a six point uh, diversity and inclusion plan. We started by calling it our diversity and inclusion plan, but it's, it's now officially our equity, diversity and inclusion plan. Um, and we have some, I think, very successful programs that we've been working on for the last couple of years. One is, um, recognizing that theaters all over the country have different needs when it comes to um, taking action on diversity and recognizing that, um, that we can't just 
from on high tell every theater that they have to do exactly the same five steps or exactly the same 10 steps. We created a diversity and inclusion institute which currently has 21 theaters around the country um, who are part of a cohort that's learning together and developing action plans and acting upon those action plans together. Um, they've been working together for about a year and a half. Um, we're working with a phenomenal consultant, Carmen Morgan. Um, we have our staff who are very dedicated to this effort. Um, one of the things that we've realized in the process of, of the Diversity Inclusion Institute is that we really have to think about the work taking place on at least three levels. One is the personal. Everyone is from a different place, a different background, different parentage, different, um, different identities. And so their experience when it, when it comes to equity, diversity, inclusion conversations, they come to the conversation um, with different ideas, with different biases, um, with different desires. Second thing is, if we start to make change, cult cultural change inside organizations and start to change the makeup of staffs, artists, um, change the discussions that take place within our organizations, that will eventually affect the overall ecology of the theater field on a national basis because um, we share artists. Ultimately, we share staffs. Um, so it's been a, a very productive effort, the Diversity and Inclusion Institute with our 21 members, including TCG. Right now we're hoping to increase uh, the number of uh, cohorts that we have working at any given time. Um, they're very energized, they're creating regional groups that are also trying to look at regional um, realities and statistics and, and, and working together on a more local basis as well. Um, another program that has been really needed and, and I think very successful. For many years, we've had a Young Leaders of Color program, which is bringing uh, between 10 and 20 Young Leaders of Color to our national conference every year. The idea is to bring these folks into, um, into the conversation, these very talented young professionals, into the national conversation about theater, um, but also to help them begin to develop networks. Um, this has been a, a, a great program over about eight years. We've evolved it into a program that we call the SPARK uh, Leadership Program, which now has 10 rising leaders of color who are very experienced leaders um, participating in some very deep uh, professional development work, self-assessment, um, and networking. We're really trying to make sure that these leaders have access to different networks that can help them in terms of their, their uh, career ambitions and desires. Um, so we're excited about the program. We, we saw just last year there were three um, young women of color who were hired as associate artistic directors in major theaters, which is a great sign because often those theaters will hire the next in command um, when the current artistic director leaves. So there's some specific uh, successes coming from that program. Um, in terms of really understanding the, the landscape as it exists today, we've talked so much today about needing to understand um, having research, having data, knowing where we stand in terms of diversity um, in our organizations and in our, in our different disciplines and across the, uh, the art sector. And we are actually, we've, we started by thinking about diversity in terms of race and ethnicity, but we've expanded because we're realizing that identity is so complex. Um, we have to think about gender equity, gender identity. We need to think about race and ethnicity. We need to think about nation of origin. Um, there are other, the ways in which people identify today are just so multifaceted. So we're, we've created a, uh, a survey that we're going to be launching very soon. It's being beta tested now called Represent. Um, and we're asking people to identify in 10 areas, eight areas of identity, self-identify. And it's not just a checkbox, because sometimes people look at the checkboxes and don't see themselves. We're, we're creating more of a, an opportunity to write in um, responses with respect to their identity. Um, so we're excited about this because we think it will have a dual uh, impact. One is we're going to gain a lot of information about who's in the field, but the second thing is that it helps people engage and it raises awareness at the same time. Um, so those are some of the, the key actions that we are taking. And again, um, I, there, there are a couple other areas. We're doing a, a legacy video project which is capturing the stories of eight to 10 leaders of color who founded theaters in the 60s and 70s. We really wanna make sure that we know their stories. What were their challenges? Um, 
what was the evolution of their theaters over time? What do they think the challenges for developing, particularly for the future of theaters of color in particular, um, how we need to support our, our, our theaters of color in, in the future? Um, so that's a project that's been really valuable and I think will be helpful to others. And then finally, speaking of theaters of color, we have a network of theaters of color that we're hoping to continue to help um, build capacity inside of because those theaters often have been um, not received the same level of resources and same opportunity to build capacity as larger theaters that tend to be predominantly white and we wanna see some equity built in terms of access to resources among our theaters of color and also just celebrate the phenomenal work um, that is happening inside those theaters today. Um, so that's a rundown of our, uh, our six point plan and I look forward to hearing any questions that you have. Great, thank you, Teresa. So, uh, <clears throat> to try to keep us on time, I'm gonna just make a couple of points and then we'll get to our next panel. There'll be a chance for some question and answer later. But I, you know, I wanna disagree with something that Tracy said, which is it takes a long time. I mean, it does take a long time. What she said was exactly accurate. It took six years until I sat down, I felt, at the Queens Museum with a staff that I felt was, but there was a degree of urgency from day one that didn't say this is gonna take a long time. If you think it's gonna take a long time and you accept that, you're never gonna get anywhere. You have to have some urgency. So we had a couple of rules. You know, I told you about sort of the Rooney rule that we followed. Uh, we also, Agnes Gund, who's one of the great heroes in this room, of course, uh, helped fund a diversity fellowship program. You know this moment in a small cultural institution where somebody leaves, you say, oh my God, they're leaving. What are we gonna do? Oh, there's the intern sitting there from Smith. I'm sorry, Thomas from Smith. But, uh, <laughs> well, you know what I'm talking about, right? And that's a volunteer intern, <laughs> right? So we had a paid internship program. It was a $10,000 fellowship. We had three per year. They were sitting there. Somebody was, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Oh, we have a diversity fellow sitting there. Let's hire her or him. Those folks have gone on to jobs, a lot of them. In fact, I, one of them went to Studio Museum is now off at, uh, out in process in LA, right? So getting, there are talented, smart, young people out there who cannot afford to be a volunteer intern at your organization. So then there's this whole pipeline question, right? Oh, there's not people in the pipeline. The question is, what pipeline are you talking about? What are the talents that you need on your staff? And if you're talking about that old pipeline that's the same old pipeline, you're not interested in making change, I think. So I think you have to think about other pipelines. One of the things we did at the Queens Museum was we started a new department, which was a separate department between education and curatorial. It was called Community Engagement and Public Programs. And that's, they did all kinds of public programming. In that department, we hired community organizers. Guess what? There are plenty of talented community organizers of color out there. That's not a pipeline problem. It's a different pipeline. So, with that, so then I was thinking about the whole question of the, within classical music, there's a lot of questions about the pipeline, right? But do you guys know El Sistema? And do you know Gustavo Duramel, who's the conductor at the LA Philharmonic? That's a different pipeline. That's a pipeline to excellence in classical music that was invented in Venezuela and adopted, for example, by Corona Youth Orchestra in Corona in Spanish completely that takes place. So there are different ways of imagining these different pipelines as well. Um, aside from it will make your organization better, which I think it will, it'll make it more fun to work there, there's also this sort of just basic fairness question. And I was thinking about this, I was in Berlin not too long ago, and there was a show about New York City in the, in the 80s. And it had all these you know, assumptions about New York City in the 80s, like, guess what, I lived in New York City in the 80s and you kind of don't get it because I am that person who understands it because I lived through it. In the disability community right now, I've heard people say, nothing about us without us. In other words, if you're gonna make decisions for people with disability, you should have people with disability at the table at that moment. That's the same situation to say, are we gonna do programs about the Latino community in Queens? Well, let's do programs with the community with folks at the table who have lived that experience. Um, and then just one more point, uh, which is people in New York have said to me, 
where are we going to find the talented young people who are, you know, well motivated? And I'll tell you where you're going to find them, CUNY. CUNY is where they're at. And I can tell you that because I taught at Queens College. I am a proud MFA holder from Hunter College. Eddie from my staff is it. We got a lot of, you know, CUNY pride. I sat down with the chancellor of CUNY. I said, what, what's your student body look like? They said, it looks like New York City. It is 40% immigrants. It's people of color. These are the self-selected, smart, young, 250,000 matriculated students in New York City. We have to figure out ways to partner with CUNY. That's where they're at. There's a lot of thought in the administration about how we can make those partnerships. So that's New York City residents. Anyway, that, those are the little points that I wanted to make. I think we really have to get on to our next panel. Um, we're going to have a little chance for a question and answer in a minute. So I wanted to welcome up to the stage Mariette Westerman, Vice President of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and Roberta Uno, Senior Program Officer at the Ford Foundation. <laughs> so I actually just wanted to do this. I'll actually use this mic, but now while I'm unfolding it. So I actually just wanted to do this as a conversation. Um, you know, in terms of uh, having this kind of conversation, when, when I had the, the privilege, Roberta, of working with you, you know, uh, we would periodically uh, speak to members of the field about what it is that we wanted to do uh, uh, as an institution and the ways in which we wanted to work with the field. And when we would, when we would uh, uh, at, at some point, have some sort of transaction around, you know, larger sort of issues, um, I would say, well, you know, I think you would want to do it, you know, for the strength of your organization. I think you would want to do it for social justice. And if it came down to it, I would say, do it for the money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wanted to have this conversation with two funders. In terms of those kinds of priorities, you know, I wanted to start off, uh, uh, Mariette. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the, the work that the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation is, is doing around diversity. I actually just wanted to start off on the issue of the benefits of diversity. I mean, you know, you're obviously prioritizing this issue, and I wanted to find out, well, you know, why? I mean, what is the benefit for our organizations of diversity? Thank you, Eddie. I think a lot has been said already that's very germane in these very moving and spirited testimonies and in Tom's call for some strategic impatience, which I really believe in as a strategy in its own right. And if I can just take a step back and reflect for a moment on what's been said here today, it's, it sounds to me as if uh, to, to enact that strategic Im, Im, uh, impatience, you might start by thinking about your mission. And so uh, the Mellon Foundation was in a very fortunate position, uh, depending on how you look at it, the last two years or so, in that we were called upon by our board of trustees to engage in a strategic planning process. And if you've ever done one, you know that that's sort of a little bit painful, especially if you've never done it before. But the one opportunity it offered was actually thinking about and reaffirming our mission. And so we did that. We reaffirmed our mission. In fact, I think it's fair to say that we, for the first time, wrote it down. We had never really had one, <laughs> which gives you a lot of opportunity to think about it. And so we now have it, and I think most of you have worked with us in some way, so you, you know it and you've looked at it. And basically, we concluded, looking at our history, looking at what is important now, looking at the demographic shifts in our society and persistent inequities in it, we decided that the Mellon Foundation clearly exists to reinforce the contributions, to, well, to reinforce and also to promote and where necessary defend, in fact, the contributions of the arts and of the humanities to human flourishing and also to the well being of diverse and democratic societies. And when you put your mission statement into a sentence like that after 18 months or so, um, you realize that. Our mission is not just about democratic and diverse societies somehow depending on uh, the insights that the arts and the humanities can produce, the knowledge they disseminate, but that in itself the arts and humanities too depend for their strength, for bringing out what they can really do for our societies on the full inputs of 
the full panoply of people that reside in this country and in fact that have connections with peoples all over the world in our global society. So if you take that mission statement as one that, that really does connect to our history and that does speak to the needs of our society today, uh, it's evident that you know, to us, you cannot have a flourishing arts sector, you cannot have flourishing higher education in the humanities and the arts, uh, and good organizations uh, that, that uh, enact uh, those missions without full representation and representativeness, and beyond that, not just the numbers, but actually processes that make those very different peoples involved in these organizations feel included, heard, and able to contribute. And, and can you talk about this, this um, survey of museums that you're developing? Yes, so the Mellon Foundation has for a long time uh, been very active in diversity and in fact the stimu stimulation of a pipeline into the American faculty, particularly in the humanities but also in certain core social sciences and sciences. And so we have about 25 years of experience with this and noticed that, as, as uh, Arnold already said, diversity does work and over time you can really make a difference. Uh, in the last few years, we've heard an increasing drum roll from many of you from museums and performing arts organizations across the nation uh, indicating that they would like to make progress more rapidly. And so we started to think, well, how do you do it? And like every organization, you look at what you know, you look at what you, uh, what you have done perhaps uh, well. And the program that has really inspired us in so many ways is this so-called Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program, which some of you may be aware of, some of you may even be graduates of, which is essentially a pipeline widening program for historically underrepresented minorities um, to, to be encouraged often first-generation students, often immigrant students, to be encouraged to consider uh, PhD training, which of course is the sine qua non uh, on the whole for a faculty position. And that's a long process. You can be as patient as you will. It does take time. You will fail a few times, but and you need numbers to get real results. And so we started thinking, what if we pull together a few of these large museums that have expressed interest in this, five big metropolitan institutions, and see if they would work with um, uh, colleges and universities that have strong undergraduate humanities programs that are also diverse. And so we are working with museums in Houston, LA, Chicago, um, Atlanta, and Kansas City to, to help those museums find undergraduate students, mentor them through several years, give, give the, open up the museum to them as a possible a place of interesting work, a place where you could, in fact, contribute to these issues that often really interest these students. We just launched that program under the leadership of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art about a year and a half ago, and one of the most surprising uh, moments of that launch was when we were interviewed by a number of journalists who kept asking, well, that's all very nice, and how are you going to do that, and you explained it, and then on more than two occasions, at the end of the interview, I would be asked, well, you know, this is all very nice, and Bellin, of course, has to do something, but how do you know there's a problem? How do you know that minorities are underrepresented on the staffs, and particularly the curatorial staff and directorial staff of museums? It almost made me laugh. It, it just seemed to me a question that seemed so self-evident that I was surprised that I was asked it. Of course, I shouldn't have been. But uh, as a result, I thought it was important to go back to the field across the country and work with the big museum organizations, the American Alliance of Museums and the Association of Art Museum Directors, and see if they would help us survey the field. And so that's what we're doing. We're surveying about 900 uh, institutions. The, the survey is going live later this week. If, if you're here and you are a museum, you'll get it in your email inbox if you're a director uh, the coming week. And we hope very much that you will work with, with your HR directors and other staff to answer questions that really will take a measure of the representatives, representativeness on various ethnic, racial, and gender categories uh, of your staff and also importantly of your board members. Uh, so that's essentially what we're doing. It is no more than establishing a baseline effort against which we'll be able to, uh, in the future, 
um, work with the field to measure progress and also see how you might make progress. So, Roberta, I wanted to ask you. I mean, you've been you've been here for twelve years supporting uh, uh, these kinds of issues, and prior to that, as as founding director of New World Theater. I mean, sort of looking at the arc of your time here and and even prior, you know, what do you see as encouraging? What do you see as inspiring? Um, I feel actually very encouraged at this moment in time. I mean, from when you look at, for example, just the kind of social changes on popular media, for example, the type of imagery, the type of stories that uh, we're, our children are being exposed to that didn't actually even exist when we were younger people, right, or um, during our parents' times. Um, when you look at the fact that you know, this population shift that's occurring, the changing demographics is actually creating a much more compelling reason and reality to look at these issues of fairness, inclusion, et cetera. So, you know, at the same time, I mean, I'll just be really frank, I go places, my husband is white and British and will be in the audience of, you know, some performance and he'll turn to me and say, I think we're the youth group here and, you know, I'm 58, um, and, and you're the, uh, you know, uh, person of color or people of color representative. So, you know, when, when you look at that kind of audience, and then when I just mentioned popular culture, you know, I look back and I think, okay, there was um, Friends and Seinfeld and Sex and the City, and now Girls, you know, this kind of white portrayal of New York City. And yet that's a reality too, because even in a city like this, we live in very um, segregated or separated social pockets, right? And how do we then disrupt that? And what role does the arts play? So, you know, thinking about what encourages me, the Ford Foundation as a grant maker has very, very specific questions around diversity. If you've ever had the privilege or the task burden <laughs> of um, being invited to develop a proposal, we have a diversity table and it doesn't say, it does um, have categories of gender, male, female, but it says uh, underrepresented. And our questions ask, what are the diversities that are important to you and your work? And then how does your board and staff um, and your programming reflect those diversities, right? And then what progress have you made? And so I think that's where I get very encouraged because I have less and less of that kind of cut and paste. We are an equal opportunity employer, you know, and like, oh, that doesn't tell me anything. It's just a policy kind of, um, you know, very gratuitous type of statement. But if you actually look at where people are, and you see that change is really a spectrum, and that you know people can make change on that spectrum. Start with where people are, and I have seen that change, and that's you know very very encouraging to me. And Marietta, I wanted to ask you a similar question. I mean, so often these these issues do take so long because this is a larger reflection of, of societal disparities that are bigger than, than us, um, but in which we all play a part. I mean, what do you see that, that sort of energizes you and inspires you? Well, I think this panel in itself, or this uh, afternoon, inspires me in the very fact that the DCA has decided to put this energy behind it because change can be made sometimes more quickly than one thinks with a little focus. I don't want to underplay the difficulties. I do think it can take a long time. The Mellon Mays undergraduate fellowship program really taught us that and we've learned from it. I like the title of this very last panel, Funding Diversity, because it not, it's not just about us funding diversity initiatives, it's also about funding diversity. Is there diversity in funding? Is there diversity in foundations? And of course, uh, the Ford Foundation puts us all to shame, I would say, when you look hard across philanthropy, uh, and it's a, in many ways a model to follow. So we're, we're thinking hard about this ourselves and don't want to underestimate what you face. That said, 
it's incredible sometimes how quickly, with a little attention, work can be done. And I thought maybe some examples could be mentioned that are not immediately in New York City, although, of course, we all know about the Studio Museum um, and, and, and applaud it. If you look at some of these rapidly changing demographic uh, communities in California, now a majority-minority state, Los Angeles a majority-minority uh, county, and you look at the work that has happened at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, how it has transformed itself uh, in the last seven or eight years under the leadership of Michael Govan, who just really did the numbers and looked hard at what communities were not included, were not coming through the door, were not on the board, had not had art that might be remotely of heritage interest to them represented in exhibitions or collection building before. If you take a look at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art website and see what they're doing, and then take a little scan of their staff and board, you will see that very rapidly he has made progress. Um, of course, Gustavo Dudamel's work and El Sistema uh, with the uh, Los Angeles Symphony were already mentioned, and I think that is one of the great examples of an institution, because this interest was already there before Gustavo Dudamel came. I think it's one of the great examples uh, that, that contravenes that easy distinction that Darren referred to, that somehow uh, it's a sacrifice to the diversity, that quality will be compromised or accent will be comp accents will be compromised. I think that uh, uh, orchestra is going through some of the really greatest uh, artistic uh, excellent experience of its long and, and distinguished history. But let me take a really uh, counterintuitive example that is not from an already demographically transforming city, and that is the city of Birmingham, Alabama. The Birmingham Museum of Art has been, for now I think 18 years or so, led by a remarkable woman named Gail Andrews, uh, an art historian who just quietly goes about her work and has done remarkable things. The Birmingham Museum of Art, uh, in the aftermath of the very difficult civil rights uh, issues that that city uh, uh, well, uh, was involved in, uh, let's put it as neutrally as we can, uh, in the aftermath, as early as 1971, decided that museum, uh, which is a mu municipally owned museum, decided to uh, begin to collect African-American art, they really decided we have to do something. It was a largely white-supported institution in many ways, remains that to this day, although change has happened. Gail Andrews, when she came, really sped up that collecting effort, reached out to African-American artists, reached out to members of the African-American community more broadly in the town. When uh, we started talking with them, uh, the first thing she requested, she said, oh, so great, we're in conversation, could we have a postdoctoral fellowship for the curation of African-American art, because we've never had such a curator, and if we ha and, and I'm not going to find probably someone who's really very advanced in their career. Let's start with the fellows, let's start with the pipeline, knowing that there is enough diversity in that early cohort of African-American art, art historians and PhD programs. On the basis of that first fellow, who's only was there for a year and a half or so, she began to reach out more broadly to the community, develop more exhibitions related to civil rights topics, related to the black experience in America in the South, related even to very traumatic uh, sort of events that happened in 1963. So I think, with w and, and, and on, the bo on, the f on the back of that effort, she has created now a fundraising effort to establish a curatorship for that position that will be very broadly carried by a number of members uh, members in the community who are not only African-American, also white, who have said we will do a very broadly carried fundraising effort, almost a Kickstarter-like effort uh, generated by that board. So I think that's one of those examples where with careful preparation, all of a sudden, change can be very rapid. I'd like to, to ask my final question of Roberta. Roberta, you're about to leave become director of Arts in a Changing America at California Institute for the Arts. Can you tell us about, about how this is a continuation of the, of the work that you've been doing all this time? Didn't know I was gonna. I think um, <laughs> we're gonna actually have a really snazzy launch in the fall of my <laughs> project. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. I know this is really breaking news and um, I just really want to say that I couldn't actually be leaving the Ford Foundation if Darren wasn't here because I have really held 
onto this arts portfolio, like, you know, like a pit bull um, <laughs> with the just kind of advocating for the arts uh, and for having a national arts program. And the four years I've worked with you, I and then your presidency, I've known that the arts are clearly going to flourish and I can think about things that really are on my agenda to, to get done. So just really quickly about that, and you will be hearing more, but um, you know, there's, there's a lot of synergy and a lot of alignment in the field right now. I think with people like Tom and Eddie at the DCA, you know, I see Judy Lee Reed at CERDNA and Elizabeth Mendes Berry, um, other former, former people that I have mentored like you and Risa Wilson and San San Wong at Barr. Uh, these kinds of values that we hold very dear um, really allow me to leave philanthropy and say, okay, I have been working on the issue of changing demographics from prior to Ford throughout my tenure here, and um, I really, really want to launch this national project. So we'll be talking more about that in the fall. Um, I did want to just say something about, because the, the example that you gave made me actually think about um, an example that I wanted to share, if that's okay, if we have time. Um, but I, I also think, you know, looking outside of New York is really important. Um, I've thought about my uh, uh, grantees who are in areas of the country that are really challenging, where, for example, just retaining the talent pool, because if you're in the arts, you leave and you go to New York, right? And so uh, one grantee uh, is the Nickelodeon Theater in Columbia, South Carolina, the only independent art film space in the entire red state, right? And they were founded in 1979, but um, Andy Smith, who's in his 30s, their director, went to college like we all do, went away uh, to Los Angeles, actually. But after the re-election of Bush the second time, he decided he was gonna go back because too many of his friends from the South had moved to what they considered progressive states. And so the decision to go back to the NIC, which had one person of color on their staff when he, he went there, and now they're 35%. They've built a new space on Main Street. You know, that's, that's under the uh, Dome of the Capitol, the Strom Thurmond statue, and the Confederate flag in a theater that was formerly a segregated theater, right? So to make that kind of progress and... I think it takes thinking outside of the box. For example, they always had that pipeline uh, development strategy, but it was not with historically black colleges included. And so to say there are HBCs in this area that have communications majors, we should be, and film programs, we should be actually partnering with them to build that type of pipeline, right? So that was one just example of thinking outside of the box. And so I would throw also an idea, you know, and I totally believe in this urgency issue. Um, we once had, actually when Judy Lee and Sam were running Leveraging Investments in Creativity, a wonderful program where there was part of the funding was a blue sky fund where the grantees had a certain amount of money that they could use for something that was unusual and out of the box. And it, you know, maybe could be around diversity issues, but other things that came up. But one day, one of the uh, grantees called and said, we're going to lose a very talented filmmaker. This was a Bay Area, Southeast Asian group based in the Tenderloin of San Francisco. We're going to lose this guy. He's amazing, but he's first generation college, and he's going to have to make some money and pay back his student loans. Um, and kind of the idea came up somehow, could we use our Blue Sky Fund to pay off his student loans or to make a big dent? And, uh, you know, actually I, I just kind of said, <coughs> well, I'll, y we said it was for unusual things, out of the box, and maybe if I don't ask permission, I won't get fired. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can say that now that I know I'm, but... <laughs> But the idea, you know, that this grant could be, could be made, and, and I got a note from this young man who, by the way, got a MacArthur Film Award, and after his MacArthur Film Award sent me the note and said, if I had not gotten my student loan repaid, I would not be the filmmaker I am now, and I know you had something to do with that, so I wanted to let you know. So for us to think about 
you know, that, that's on the entry side of that pipeline, right? And you're working on the PhD, the top side of that pipeline. I think we have to use all those strategies. So, thank you so much. I want to I want to hand this off to Tom, but I also just wanted to say, just for a very brief moment, you know, I obviously have the privilege of working with Tom, and I've had the privilege of working with both Darren and Roberta, and you know, I got my start actually in community arts, working with Bill Aguado uh, at the Bronx Council on the Arts for the <laughs> for the first decade of my career, and and just to to continue to continue to work with all of you in the field. It's been a, just this continued uh, process of inspiration. So thank you so much. All right, so I, I feel very guilty. There's an overflow room upstairs of our friends and brothers and sisters. And I'm going to go up there and say hi to them while Darren entertains you with his closing comments. You're stuck with, with Tracy and I. We'll take a couple of questions, and then, and then Darren will say a few words so that we can go on to our reception. Uh, any questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Robin from StoryCorps, and my question is for Arnold. Um, about um, programming. Is he still there? Oh, okay. Oh, Arnold has left okay. already. I'm okay. sorry. Well, that's okay. I'll take it for anybody else who wants to chime in and help. I'm really interested in this idea about how programming itself increases diversity in your hiring mm -hmm. and in your board. And so I just love any uh, intel on how that works. That sounds like a question for the field. Uh, my name is Paul Slee. I'm with Ensemble Studio Theater. Um, our theater's. Uh, um, an ensemble of hundreds of New York City theater artists, and uh, our governance requires artists in governance, so this may be somewhat helpful, but we started a program, our artists started a program called Last Call, which is sort of an evening cabaret, and one of the artists who is driving that program joined our board because there's work for him to do as an artist in our theater, <clears throat> pardon me, and uh, his name is Sean Randall, he's an amazing producer, actor, and theater person. So I hope that's helpful. Hi, uh, my name is Ade Tubielli. I'm the director of studio art programs at the Lower East Side Girls Club, Alphabet City Art School. Um, thank you all for being here and inviting us to join in this conversation. I'm interested in anyone answering the question on how to balance color with content and competence. Um, color is still a very important issue, especially in light of the Black Lives Mo Matter movement. Obama in the State of the Union, he said all lives matter. We've talked today, we've heard from various people say, you know, it's not just about um, blacks or white, you know, it's Jews, Chinese, people from all backgrounds. But how do you instill, my girls at the Girls Club are from low income, a lot of them live in the projects. I'm a teacher as well, I teach art. How do you instill in them seeing a black face in the classroom, but also seeing a competent black face and also someone whose content reflects their world? Because I have black friends whose lives and experiences may come from white backgrounds or other backgrounds. And so I'm just wondering how you feel the best way is to balance all of those needs. You know, we do have a large population of black men in prison. You know, if you want to hire a black man in your organization, how do you balance that with the content and the competence so that the people that you're teaching know that there's, um, they should strive for excellence as well as diversity. That's really great. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by these questions because it's not as if, you know, we imagine at the Department of Cultural Affairs we have those answers. I'm, I'm confident that the field together really has those answers, you know? Um, we're happy to facilitate these kinds of conversations. I mean, personally, uh, and this is me speaking as an individual, um, I think that we far too often speak of color and content and excellence as though they're mutually exclusive. Um, you know, I remember when, when I had the privilege of working with Sam and Judah Lee at Link, and at one point we were, we were um, looking at artography applicants, and um, I think it was the Maine Basket Weavers Association was one of, the, one of the applicants. And we were looking at baskets. I mean, the, the worst basket and the best basket I've ever seen didn't look that different to me. 
<laughs> because I didn't have that level of content in terms of, in terms of my education or my experience or my cultural background. So we needed to bring in people as, as you know, panelists and, and, and reviewers who had that kind of, of content knowledge, you know? And, and otherwise, it could have been very easy to simply say, I don't care about baskets, you know? Um, so I, ho I hope that's helpful. Andrea and then back to Andrea. Yeah. Hi, thank you. My name is Andrea Louie, and I'm the executive director of the Asian American Arts Alliance. Um, I wanted to speak to the pipeline issue, and I wanted all of us as a community, as an arts community, to really um, look at who is already living and working and making art and being an arts administrator in our city already. Um, you know, there's a very robust and vibrant uh, art making world in the in the people of color community already. And a lot of times what has happened is when there is a perception that there is no point of access to perhaps major cultural institutions or, or uh, larger presenting organizations or art making organizations, um, people of color have started their own. So I really look to, look to us to engage um, folks who are in the fiscally sponsored organizations yeah. and so forth. I think we're already here, yeah. so yeah. let's talk. No, I completely <laughs> agree. I'm actually after I, I'll give you in a second. After <laughs> this, I'm I'm going to the reception for the Queen's Council on the Arts for their regranting program. We we support a regranting program so that they're able to support the smaller organizations, those that don't have 501c3 status, et cetera. And uh, I completely agree. I, I and I think that's a, a very rich pipeline. Roberta, you wanted to say yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment to Andrea that. Uh, you know, I think that this issue of changing demographics also begins to surface a lot of practice that is not only nascent and burgeoning, but actually of enormous scale and occurring in ways that may not fit into our boxes. So one thing I thought was very interesting, looking at the city lore place matters map, where they look at something like the West Indian Day Parade, right? We, we know how huge that is, but then also looking at where do those practices, where do, you know, the, uh, the dances they're doing, where are they rehearsing? That's choreography, those are dancers. What about those incredible costumes? Who is the person making that? Where is that workshop? And putting that on an actual map of New York, very, very interesting. So, um, and not to be self-serving, but this, um, there's, they just, Creative Time just sent me a, a link to the summit that happened in Stockholm and actually spoke about this issue of scale so that uh, I, I use two examples, one from New York, the Hindu temple in Flushing, and one, the Pacific Northwest canoe journeys, where these are very large. Uh, the Flushing temple has 22,000 members sustaining it, which I think is on par with the Studio Museum of Harlem. Uh, you know, so um, that's something that will also be in the GIA reader. They're gonna reprint that presentation as kind of the notes and photos. Hi, I'm Sheila Lewandowski from the Chocolate Factory Theater in Long Island City. And some of what my question to the funders, which goes on to what Andrea was saying, um, it has to do with geographic diversity and the impact of supporting um, organizations and groups in neighborhoods so it's not consolidated. I think the work of Brooklyn Museum, Queens Museum is amazing. But um, throughout the city where people live, like where are those rehearsals happening for the West Indian Day Parade? Where are those costumes being made? They may have connections with small arts groups there who don't normally have access to your funding streams. And Queens County Arts and the Arts Councils do not provide enough funding to support those groups either because those are very small grants. So are you diversifying, this gets back to what Ms. Westerman said, your funding and looking for ways to give these small groups access to these pools of money so they continue to make and support work where people live and not just where people travel to. Thank you very much for the question. I hear a certain resonance for it and of course we feel it ourselves. Uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, problem that certainly needs attending to and the way that uh, large foundations uh, and places like the NEA and I assume also the DCA think about this is how do you balance 
your in-house staff and expertise and how much grant management you can handle in relation to the amount of money you have to give away. Because the more institutions you need to get to know well and closely, which is something I think the Mellon Foundation and these other organizations do well, uh, the more you spend on yourself, the less you have to give away. So you sort of end up eating into the very pool you're trying to, to preserve. So one way that we get around it, and our performing arts program does this, I think, especially well, is through regranting. So there are any number of regranting programs uh, that where we work through the, you know, the uh, New England Foundation, for example, uh, Dance NYC, any any number of organizations that help us do that vetting process. So we will make a block grant, and that money may no longer look like Mellon money by the time it gets to these organizations, but we still think of it as such. That said, I think there is good cause, especially with our recent reaffirmation of our mission, to review and we do this really on a standing basis every year, are we reaching sufficient diversity, not just in New York City, but a, a around the nation? Thank you. There's two more hands up. There was one here and one here. I actually have, uh, I'm Arun Shivdasani, Executive Director of the Indo-American Arts Council. I have a question about this whole about terminology, because the whole evening we've been here, afternoon, we've heard about white and color, but we're all in the arts and we all know that white is also a color. And a color doesn't mean that you just employ one African American and you've co covered the whole color diversity issue. So I do think that later in the um, discussion, uh, Mariette and Roberta talked more about ethnicities and races. And I think that's how it should be, should be addressed because someone from Norway and someone from America doesn't think alike and their color is not the same. So, I mean, I was looking at three white people sitting there. They're not all white. One was pink, one was brownish, one was white. <laughs> So, you know, I don't think that, the, you know, especially all of us in the arts, we can't say color and white. So I think we have to address that terminology also, because if on my board I have one Hispanic person, that doesn't mean I've covered everybody. No, I completely agree. And it's, it's one of the, the um, balances that we're going to have to consider, those of us that are considering something along the lines of any form of survey instrument. On one hand, probably the easiest thing for an executive director to do is simply look at the forms that employees have filled out, which basically follow the EEOC requirements, which are very, very broad. On the other hand, there's the issue of, well, how do I consider all of the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> how do I consider all of the nuance within a category like Asian, for instance? And how much work is that gonna wind up creating for, for the organization that I interface with? One last question, and then I'd like to hand it off to Darren. Beth. Hi everybody, I'm Beth Tuttle, I'm the president of the Cultural Data Project and about in 2010 we did a, um, a pilot program for data collection specifically around diversity in Chicago and it spoke specifically to, it was really asking arts and culture organizations and practitioners about um, you know how hard would this be for you, could you answer these questions and, and all of the answers aside, what was so surprising to us was how violently and vehemently negative the response was from these organizations mm -hmm. to even being asked to answer the question. I will say that now as we are deeply engaged in rethinking the profile and deeply committed to asking these questions now, there's been a huge change. And I think that what's happening here in this room and what's happening around the country is making way for people to be able to say, we, we know we have to answer these questions and, and we're prepared to do it. But the one thing that I heard and everything, particularly Tracy that you said and, and that Tom said, is we're going to partner with you, right? We as grant makers, which many in this room are, are going to partner with you. This is not a punitive thing and it's not about saying, are you on the good team or the bad team or on the up or the down? That dialogue, I will submit, has to be incredibly powerfully um, enacted as we move through this change because we can implement the questions, you all can implement the questions, we have to have people begin to solve with the data that they're collecting because it's not just about can we report it, it it's really about how are we gonna use it and do something effective with it. So I guess my question is really a hope 
in fact, that that notion of partnership and dialogue between the grant makers and those of us in the room who are submitting this information, who are trying to make this move, that that is a really well and robust conversation. Uh, absolutely. I mean, Tom and the entire agency means for this to be a constructive project with input and uh, dialogue in how we develop the survey, um, uh, how it's given to you. We don't want to overburden you such that you don't have time uh, for the art that we fund and find so important. But um, we're glad you're here to participate. And again, we look forward to talking more with you about it. And this is the, the first in a series of conversations that we're going to have with you throughout this process. So we're so grateful that you're engaged and we're grateful for you. Thank you. So, so I hope this has been um, an informative and inspiring um, afternoon. What I would say is representing the Ford Foundation and um, owning the things that we have done to contribute to um, some of the, I think, uh, progress we have made, but also some of the behaviors that we in philanthropy um, exhibit and manifest that often get in the way and undermine what you are trying to do. And so one of the things we'll be doing this year at the foundation is really taking a step back um, with the transition of leadership, with Roberta's decision to um, go to the West Coast, um, with the head of the program, leaving um, <laughs> us. Don't celebrate just yet, Roberta. I'm going to tell them about your celebration in a moment. The, the opportunity for us is to really take a step back. And so you'll be receiving a communication from me um, in a few weeks about how we're going to go about this year of really asking um, your perspectives on what we could do better to be a more effective foundation and to listen better and be um, less hubristic and more humble and um, hopefully um, hear what your needs are before we decide actually what strategy we're going to impose upon you. So I'm really looking forward to that. And, um, and uh, Roberta wants to make sure, I mean, well, Roberta, I'm just going to invite them all to your party. So Roberta's having a big party. Where I'm having a great party for Roberta on March 26th. So um, get ready. It's going to be a great blow out, blowout. So uh, mark it in your calendars in the 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock? 5 o'clock, yeah. Uh, five o'clock-ish on the 26th of March. But for now, we're going to have a reception in the atrium, right, Roberta? We're going up, um, yeah, into the atrium, and um, we've got refreshments there. Thanks so much for coming this afternoon. <laughs>